The low point of the Depression was 1820. However, the subsequent recovery was slow. In 1824, Henry Clay, a Speaker of the House of Representatives, used the continued economic slump to promote a new protective tariff bill. Clay suggests a remedy. He states, Are we doomed to behold our industry languish and decay, yet more and more? But there is a remedy, and that remedy consists in modifying our foreign policy and in adopting a genuine American system, by adequate protection against the otherwise overwhelming influence of foreigners. This is only to be accomplished by the establishment of a tariff. He added, the sole object of the tariff is to tax the produce of foreign industry with a view of promoting American industry. In Clay's opinion, the current economic distress was again a result of an imbalance of foreign trade. The cure was building up the manufacturing sector through the use of the protective tariff. The new tariff bill proposed an increase of approximately 30% on iron, lead, glass, wool, hemp, cotton bagging, and cotton and woolen goods. During the Senate debate on the bill, Senator Robert Hayne of South Carolina voiced the South's objections. Considering the scheme of promoting certain employments at the expense of others as unequal, oppressive, and unjust, viewing prohibition as the means and destruction of all foreign commerce the end of this policy, I take this occasion to declare that we shall feel ourselves justified in embracing the very first opportunity of repealing all such laws as may be passed for the promotion of these objects. In Haynes' view, the protection of one branch of industry at the expense of others was unjust and economically oppressive. Congressman and future Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts echoed Haynes' sentiments with his own speech against a new tariff. He first argued that economic conditions were not as bad as Clay had suggested. Then he stated, With me it is a fundamental axiom, it is interwoven with all my opinions, that the great interests of the country are united and inseparable, that agriculture, commerce, and manufacturers will prosper together or languish together, and that all legislation is dangerous which proposes to benefit one of these without looking to consequences which may fall on the others. Webster also recognized the moral and political problems associated with the Henry Clay-inspired tariff. First, he argues that the tariff would clearly benefit one economic sector while penalizing another. Webster notes that protective tariff legislation is dangerous. Since Webster stresses the unity of the country, he may be alluding to the possibility of future sectional division within the country. As a senator, Webster will vote for the tariff of 1828. Most in the agricultural and commercial sectors had come to see the tariff as economically unjust. Since the South was primarily agricultural, it felt the burden more keenly. Their reasoning went this way. The tariff stifles foreign competition of manufactured goods. This allows northern manufacturers to substantially increase their prices. Since the South did not manufacture these goods, capital was thus diverted north. Also, since southern cotton growers sold heavily to Britain and other European nations, a tariff decreased European exports, thus decreasing their need for southern cotton. The result was a decrease in the southern economy and income. Further, the South feared a retaliatory tariff. A tariff on southern cotton by Europe would cripple their exports. Constitutional objections to the tariff were also starting to arise in the South. John Randolph of Virginia stated, We of the South are the eel that is being flayed. If under a power to regulate trade, you prevent exportation. If you draw the last drop of blood from our veins. If you draw the last shilling from our pockets. What are the checks of the Constitution to us? A fig for the Constitution. The Tariff Bill of 1824 narrowly passed the Senate. It passed the House by a narrow margin, 107 yeas to 102 nays. The vote came down along sectional lines. 47 out of 48 representatives from the South voted no. Future Senator Hayne of South Carolina issued an ominous warning during the debate. Whatever interests may grow up under this bill and whatever capital may be invested, I wish it to be distinctly understood that we will not hold ourselves bound to maintain the system. 
And if capitalists will, in the face of our protests and in defiance of our solemn warnings, invest their fortunes in pursuits made profitable at our expense, on their own heads be the consequences of their folly. The division over the protective tariff plank of the American system would continue to intensify. Following the tariff of 1824, it is estimated that northern profits on manufacturing climbed as high as 25%, while agriculture yielded about 4%, and southern land as low as 2%. The tariff raised the minimum duty on cotton from 25% to 33%. The average rate was raised to 37%. As South Carolina's economy was dependent on exports and unprotected world markets, it was particularly hard hit by the increases. In 1825, the price of cotton dropped from 21 cents per pound to 12 cents a pound, and the next year it dropped again to 8.8 .8 cents a pound. From 1825 to 1827, South Carolina's exports declined from 11 million to 8 million. It seems that the South's claim that the tariff would damage their economy was valid. Dartmouth historian Charles Wilkes observes, Tariff sentiment rose with rising profits. The protectionist movement came to be as completely sectional as slavery itself. In 1826, the push for a new tariff and greater profits began. In 1826, woolen manufacturers began to petition their state legislatures and then Congress for a tariff to protect their industry. Sensing the agitation for a new tariff, the South began to respond. The following is a statement from the citizens of Richland District, South Carolina. The duties laid by Congress of whatever description are levied in great part on articles purchased by Southern industry and consumed by the South. But these duties are expended almost exclusively for the benefit of other sections of the Union. The inequality and injustice of this state of things is becoming too glaring to remain unnoticed, and the burdens it imposes on us too heavy to be borne in silence any longer. These types of petitions to Congress from the citizens of South Carolina were increasing in frequency in anticipation of a new tariff bill. Despite protests from the South, a new tariff was passed on May 19, 1828. It raised the already high duties from 33% to 50%. Notice the House of Representatives vote. 94% of Southern congressmen voted against the bill. The vote passed the Senate 26 to 21. Interestingly, Daniel Webster, now a senator from Massachusetts, voted for the bill. It seems the manufacturing sector had become a powerful voting bloc within the state. In the South, the bill became known as the Tariff of Abominations. Following 1828, the economy of South Carolina continued to decline. Many in South Carolina attributed the state's economic woes to the tariff legislation. South Carolina Congressman George McDuffie put forth a succinct economic argument that appeared to influence many farmers in the South. It became known as the 40 Bale Theory. His theory stated that since protectionist tariffs raised the price of goods, consumers were paying a hidden tax on their items. Since manufacturers also paid more for the item, they also paid a percentage of the tax. To make up this shortfall, the manufacturer paid less for raw materials from the South, thus also making the South poorer. In McDuffie's words, the manufacturer actually invades your barns and plunders you of 40 out of every 100 bales that you produce. While McDuffie's mathematics may have been inaccurate, most economists today agree that tariffs generally make everyone poorer. Economist Jeffrey Rogers Hummel states, Economic theory proves, with only a few technical exceptions that almost never obtain in the real world, that the losses from trade restrictions exceed the gains. The tariff of abominations not only redistributed income from Southerners and other consumers to Northern manufacturers, but the process made average Americans poor.
Following the vote on the tariff, South Carolina politicians began to discuss how they would respond to the tariff. The legislature asked then-Vice President John Calhoun to prepare a report on the tariff situation. Calhoun responded with a treatise called Exposition and Protest. In his treatise, Calhoun stated the commonly held Southern opinion that the protective tariff was unconstitutional. He stated, The whole system of legislation imposing duties on imports, not for revenue, but the protection of one branch of industry at the expense of others, is unconstitutional, unequal, and oppressive, and calculated to corrupt the public virtue and destroy the liberty of the country. Using the compact theory of the Union as his foundation, he suggested that a state could veto a federal law if it was found unconstitutional. He went on, May there be a conflict between the Constitution and the laws, whereby the rights of citizens may be affected? A remedy may be found in the power of the courts to declare the law unconstitutional, in such cases as may be brought before them. The courts mentioned here by Calhoun are state courts, if the state courts found a federal law to be unconstitutional, then the state legislature could void the law. This became known as the doctrine of nullification. Even with Calhoun's treatise in 1828, he was still considered a moderate in South Carolina's nullification drive. However, it appears that Calhoun's exposition had sown the seeds for a possible confrontation between South Carolina and the United States government over the tariff issue. South Carolina hoped the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828 would help the anti-tariff cause. Though Jackson was not a protectionist in the Henry Clay vein, he still felt protectionism was justified for products essential to military preparedness and did not believe that the current tariff should be reduced until the national debt was fully paid off. In his first inaugural speech, he said, With regard to a proper selection of the subjects of imposts with a view to revenue, it would seem to me that the spirit of equity, caution, and compromise in which the Constitution was formed requires that the great interests of agriculture, commerce, and manufacturers should be equally favored, and that perhaps the only exception to this rule should consist in the peculiar encouragement of any products of either of them that may be found essential to our national independence. Even though Jackson believed no industry should be favored over another, he offered South Carolina no specific help on the tariff question. Although Jackson was a strong states' rights advocate, he was adamantly opposed to the doctrine of nullification, probably because he saw in it the seeds of secession. In April 1830, his response to nullification was not very comforting to South Carolina. Please give my compliments to my friends in your state, and say to them that if a single drop of blood shall be shed there in opposition to the laws of the United States, I will hang the first man I can lay my hand on engaged in such treasonable conduct upon the first tree I can reach. The South's optimism over a Jacksonian presidency was waning fast. On January 19, 1830, a series of Senate debates took place between Daniel Webster from Massachusetts and Robert Hayne from South Carolina, centering around the issues of the nature of the Union, states' rights, and nullification. The debates attracted national attention and exposed to many the serious divergence of views between federal authority versus state authority that had developed between the sections. Following the debates, nullifiers in South Carolina strove to strengthen their political position. By the end of 1830, they had captured the leading political positions within the state. Through 1831 and 32, their cause gained momentum. On May 28, 1832, George McDuffie, in a speech on the tariff in the House of Representatives, issued a veiled warning. Whatever may be the issue of this controversy, and whatever may be our respective destinies, I trust in God that our common inheritance, though it should be divided, may never be destroyed. By May 1832, the nullifiers were in control of the legislature. Perhaps recognizing the gravity of the situation, Congress passed a new tariff on July 14, 1832. The new rates were reduced to those of the 1824 tariff, 
Texas did not appease South Carolina. It seems the issue had now become the nature of the protective tariff in general. In November 1832, a nullification convention met in South Carolina. The convention declared that the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 were unconstitutional and unenforceable within the state of South Carolina after February 1, 1833. President Jackson was furious. He stated, Nullification leads directly to civil war and bloodshed and deserves the execration of every friend of the country. Jackson believed that nullification was treason and would have to be put down with arms. As Daniel Webster put it, I have not the slightest doubt that both General Jackson and Governor James Hamilton Jr. fully expect a decision by the sword. When it seemed that civil war would break out, a compromise was reached. Henry Clay and John Calhoun proposed the Tariff of 1833, which reduced the tariff in two-year intervals over the next decade until it reached an average of 20% in 1842. The bill passed the House on March 2, 1833, and eventually passed the Senate. This appeased South Carolina and the rest of the South, and a bloody conflict was averted. For the next 25 years, tariffs remained relatively moderate and free trade dominated U.S. economic policy. It appeared that Henry Clay's American system was dead. However, in 1859, a future president of the United States proclaimed, I was an old Henry Clay tariff Whig. In old times, I made more speeches on that subject, protective tariffs, than any other. I have not since changed my views. This president's name was Abraham Lincoln. During his administration, tariff rates reached 47%. Federal improvement subsidies, especially to railroads, soared and a national banking system was instituted. The official United States economic policy became a resurrected Henry Clay American system. However, this time, there were no Jacksons, Calhouns, or Randolphs to oppose it. Thanks for watching Historical Spotlight. You can watch more historical videos at www.historicalspotlight.com.